Thank you, Pat, for that gracious introduction, and good morning to all of you. Um, so I'm probably as excited to be here in San Diego as all of you. This is my first CASAS Summer Institute and hopefully not my last. But I think, you know, I'll echo the comment that the, the best experience for me has really been about networking and sharing and learning from all of you who are, are, are closer to students and closer to programs than I am. So CASAS has invited me here today to talk about some transformative changes to the adult education system um, and what programs and what states can do to adjust to these changing realities. And it's a rare opportunity that we get to really step back from the daily sort of nitty gritty of program evaluation and, and budget levels and, and educational gain levels to think about not just how we're doing this work but why we're doing it in the first place and what are the overall goals of the adult education system and then how can we change our programs to better meet those needs. It's a really exciting time to be in this field, uh, but it's also a very uh, tremendously challenging time, as many of you can attest to. It's actually a testament to the dedication and the passion that you all have for your students and for the work that you do, that you're in fact still here after sort of the many years and the building turmoil in this system. But on a more personal note, uh, California, being back in California for me is really important uh, because it's where my family got its start. Uh, my great grandfather was a Mexican immigrant who came here with six daughters and five dollars. They worked as migrants up and down the California migrant trail uh, during the Great Depression and sending those girls to school to learn English and to go to high school whenever it was possible. All of them learn English together, ironically, at an adult ed school in LA, just about two hours up from, uh, up from where we are. He thought and he knew that learning English and learning trades was his ticket to a better life. Um, and it was. He and his daughters ended up having good, at the time, factory jobs and buying a house in California and setting roots down. My grandma, uh, who is uh, one from the left, or from your right, it was the only one to graduate high school in spite of years of working in the fields and during the Great Depression and not really knowing any English when she got here. So it was these stories of my family that drew me to this field and they're no different than any of the thousands and hundreds of thousands of immigrants who come to this, this country seeking a better life, seeking greater opportunity that they find themselves in our system um, day after day. And also those experiences really drew me to better understand how we can change the system to meet those economic needs that I know my family had and I know that economic that immigrants have when they come to this country continu to continuously. It's really a foregone conclusion that adult education is in the midst of this wave of change. And it's driven by an economy that is rapidly leaving behind workers that can't demonstrate workforce and college readiness. Some people are calling this sort of a renaissance period for adult education, and maybe it is. There's new research and new learning that's being done to really change the way we think about adult education and its potential for students. But some people really are not thinking about this as a renaissance period. For a lot of people, this is a change, and this is something different than that, that's happened to them and that, that, that they've been in the system. Maybe of those of you who have been to these summer institutes for 15, 30 years, that's different than the way you may have operated before. It's another demand for a system that is already barely scraping by. And when the only national news about adult education is how yet another program has been eliminated, it can really be almost impossible to think about system change. So who has read the self-help, I'm not sure if it's easy to see here, who's read the self-help book, Who Moved My Cheese? A lot of people, okay. For those of you who haven't, it's a good, quick 15 minute read, there's about 24 point type, it's an excellent self-help book that was written a long, long time ago. So for those of you who have read it, your cheese has been moved. So what are we gonna do? How can we change that system to find it and to meet the needs of a changing workforce? All of us have found that impact of socioeconomic trends on the economy, and maybe among your students or in your own family. So looking at individual macro uh, changes that, are, are, that are, are driving the shift. Unemployment, and it may be difficult to see here, uh, this chart shows the unemployment rate among workers at varying education levels. And sort of the blue line at the very top are workers without a high school, with less than a high school diploma. Whereas the, the purple line at the bottom uh, are people with a bachelor's degree or higher. So over time, the unemployment rate has actually grown for people who have uh, a high school diploma or even less. And that gap has been widened in the aftermath of the Great Recession. 
Furthermore, for those who even have jobs, who are lucky enough to have jobs, that wage disparity between higher and lower educated workers continues to grow. So workers without a high school diploma or even some college make only a fraction of the pay that their higher educated peers enjoy. So to your very right, obviously, the earnings of, of those with a professional degree, and to your very left are those with a less than a high school diploma. There's a huge wage gap, and that wage gap is continuing to grow as well. What's more, the proportion of jobs that require post-secondary credential will increase to the point at which there are about 64% of all jobs in the workplace. The actual number of jobs by 2018 for those who have high school graduate or less than a high school diploma will actually remain fairly stagnant. So the proportion of jobs within the economy will actually fall. Despite these changes, the majority of adult education programs continue to focus just on basic literacy and preparation for a GED. And maybe that's because the way it's always been, or maybe that because it appears that you really don't have the resources to do much of anything else. But by standing still and sort of not changing the way we are doing business, we're effectively signing students up for a life of low wages, a greater likelihood of unemployment, and really depriving the country of a larger tax base and a more competitive workforce that we're going to need in this recovering economy. But the good news is that we already have multiple systems to meet the uh, to help adults re-engage in the workforce and meet the needs, the educational and training needs of various populations. These are local workforce systems, community colleges, career and technical education systems, and in particular, adult education is a vital engine of opportunity for those who have the longest road ahead of them and maybe the hardest to serve. Adult Ed touches uh, about two million adults each year, at a minimum about two million adults each year, and helps them attain their educational and economic goals. But the bad news is that adult education has so far not really been set up well to meet these new objectives. So the problems are the impediments to the adult education system currently that are getting in the way of us meeting these transition and post-secondary credential goals. First, for the level of funding provided, the system really has too many goals. The system serves workplace literacy, ESL, basic literacy, GED prep, family literacy. And as you know, for the amount of funding that you have, in terms of a cost per student, it gets, you know, you start need to start winnowing down your goals. Secondly, classes are very much focused on the GED as the ultimate goal, to the exclusion of preparation for college and career readiness. Thirdly, while open entry and open access has facilitated access for a wide number of students, it really hasn't always provided as intensive and a sustained experience that students are needing to make sure that they're prepared for college and careers and not just the receipt of a GED or an educational gain level. Fourth, while many adult education providers try to foster partnerships to support student success, there's just not enough resources to do this in a very systemic way. Students who are moving, moving uh, in programs that are longer and more sustained and intense need additional supportive services like transportation assistance, child care assistance, uh, food stamps, other assistance that, that adult education just cannot provide. Fifth, the sequential approach dominates the vast majority of adult education programs and pretty much all uh, education and training programs. Students sort of must master one discrete set of skills before moving to that next level of education. But for adult students, there's actually been research that shows that for each level they have to go through, it actually reduces their likelihood of ever, ever attaining uh, uh, post-secondary or marketable skills that would help them in the labor market. So that's where we're getting sort of these more integrated concurrent enro enrollment models as the answer to the solution. So lastly, adult education courses are really not connected to job opportunities locally. Um, and, and then and this is not for lack of trying, right? So there's a lot of partnerships between one stops and local workforce investment boards. But on a system wide level, there's just really not a lot of formal connections that students can use. In addition, despite the fact that all of these education and training systems exist in each state, most of the programs continue to work in silos to the detriment of students they serve. They, so they have their own functions, their own turf, and don't really go outside of that. But federal and state program requirements actually create disincentives to work together most of the time. Although the Office of Vocational and Adult Education has recently, at the federal level, has recently taken steps to bridge this gap by reforming the way performance is measured in, in programs, bringing Title I and Title II of the Workforce Investment Act, the adult education and workforce systems, at least a little bit closer together. 
Um, and in the last decade, organization states and the federal government have really had a laser focus on ensuring that more learners with low basic skills obtain meaningful skill gains and are better connected with opportunities to earn a post-secondary credential with value uh, in their regional or local labor market. A series of these national initiatives, uh, shifting gears, accelerating opportunity, achieving the dream, policy to performance, have supported finding new ways to both modernize adult education and raise expectations for students and programs, thus overcoming the barriers of that current system that we just went through. So the most promising and comprehensive approaches thus far have been coined career pathways approaches that include career pathway bridge programs for those students in adult ed who need to bridge that gap between adult education and post-secondary credentials. States and regions with career pathways efforts offer a seamless transition from one system to the next. And they're also uh, provided with jobs, internships, intrusive advising, contextualized instruction, and supportive services. There's a pathway of prescribed courses, so students never fall out of the system. They just are able to uh, access the next level of edu education and, and leave whenever they'd like to, to reach successively higher levels of employment. These pathways are almost always validated by local employers or industry and involve all of these systems working together. Employers are, are key partners in terms of developing the curriculum, validating what you're teaching, validating those content standards, and making sure that the, the skills that your students are learning in your classrooms and the Career Pathways programs will be useful in their local, um, in, in, when the student goes to, to find a job. Career Pathways models are based on an understanding, a uh, research understanding, and evidence base of what works for student transitions and post-secondary completion. So the research on what works. This, um, these, these quick bullets here is a synthesis of about uh, a half a dozen studies from the Community College Research Center on what works in basic skills transition and, um, and student post-secondary completion. So first of all, clear, tightly structured paths through basic skills, non-credit, and credit post-secondary coursework really have, makes sure that students are staying on one path and not falling out. Um, that may mean constricting the courses that students can sign up for. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that students are sort of overwhelmed by the complexity of the choices that they must make when they enter post-secondary education. So the goal here is to really constrain those options and make sure they have a guided path towards, uh, towards their ultimate goal. Contextualization also may accelerate student learning. Uh, it may accelerate student learning not just in the occupational skills that will be contextualized, but also it just helps them learn basic academic skills faster. Third, the sooner students enter a program of study, the more likely are, they are to actually complete a credential. Um, and this is regardless of what program of study they ultimately end up in. Just the mere fact of committing to a program of study and committing to a particular occupational area uh, means that they're gonna be more likely to complete. Uh, the good thing is that adult students have been found to, to more often enroll in programs of study more quickly than younger students who sort of seem to go around and take a little bit of an alternate path. Lastly, financial aid, or, or second to last, financial aid is critical for access and success, but also other benefits can supplement student success. Uh, a lot of work has been done to make sure that students know the benefits for which they may be eligible, like transportation assistance, child care assistance, food stamps, TANF, all of these additional, any state aid, and all of these additional benefits. Uh, research has shown that actually students really don't apply, despite the fact that a lot of inde low income independent students without children are eligible for things like financial aid, they just don't apply, they never fill out a FAFSA, and they don't know that those resources are available to them. Lastly, the more remedial classes that students end up in, the less likely they are to ever get a credential, to ever complete a program of study. So adult education courses should be designed to completely bypass developmental education altogether. It's just a big black hole, uh, not just for adult ed students with low basic skills, but for everyone. And it's undergoing its own wave of change in, within that field. Career pathway programs have been seeded in pockets of innovation in a number of states throughout the country. Um, and then now, they're now flourishing in about 10 states nationwide. And while few formal evaluative studies have been conducted on the efficacy of these programs, almost all of them are showing some really promising signs of results. Early studies show that students are more likely than regular adult education students to earn college credit, earn a certificate, or even receive learning gains on basic skills tests. 
So even just being in this, in this type of a program that's contextualized, that's more supportive, students are even just more likely to gain uh, educational gains faster than they would in traditional programs. Students in some programs also express a high degree of appreciation for, for the supportive services, for the integrated instruction, for the additional support that they receive while they're in the program, in that career pathway bridge program approach. But what does one program or one state begin in terms of a process of implementing a career pathways bridge model? And most importantly, what will this shift towards career pathways and an increased focus on post-secondary transitions mean for you as a program administrator, state level administrator, director or adult educator? How do you get out of right field and into playing the game? So for a new adult education paradigm to take shape, it will require coordination and action at all levels, local, state, and federal. So how many of you are at the local level? I imagine it's most. So okay. So this is for you. So local practices are instrumental to the success of career pathway bridge programs. Key components of successful bridge programs have included strategies that combine basic skills and ESL career and technical content, also with general workforce preparation skills, particularly for students who are at the lower levels of instruction. Another element is contextualizing basic skills and English language content to the knowledge needed in a specific occupation or occupational area. Another programmatic reform would be to be using new or modified curricula that's validated by employers that has identified learning targets also for basic skills instruction but also for occupational content and that makes sure that curricula is, is uh, clearly articulated to the next step in a college or career pathway, whatever that next step may be. Another element is changing how your classes are delivered. And I know a lot of you are already doing this, uh, making sure that dual enrollment, paired courses, team teaching, as well as flexible scheduling for students to make sure that they can come uh, whenever it's, it's possible for them to come, either it's evenings or weekends or during the day for students who have night shifts. Another uh, programmatic reform would be to support student success through enhanced student services. Uh, this would include things, as I mentioned before, about making sure that students are eligible for or are aware of the services for which they may be eligible, having transition coaches, having career coaches, having uh, multiple opportunities to connect with an admissions advisor at a community college or a local one-stop or a representative from a local one-stop to identify, to so have a good sense of career awareness and what opportunities may be out there for them. Another, the last program in, in, uh, innovation that I'll talk about is connections to local employers and community needs by engaging key partners in design and implementation of your programs. Uh, so a number one ingredient for these bridge programs and career pathway efforts are building partnerships. Uh, not just with employers, but with uh, local workforce investment boards, one stops, community colleges, having a sense of what the community around you offers and seeing how you can all leverage to be a part of that career pathway system. So how many of you are at the, um, at the state level? Okay, raise your hands higher, I can't see them. Okay, great. Um, and even in states that have clearly defined criteria for what a pathway uh, should look like, programs often modify a specific uh, industry and instructional model to meet a particular regional or labor market need. I mean, I recognize all of your states, all of your regional areas are different and should be tailored as such to your particular industry. Uh, some states have a really high proportion of jobs that, that uh, you know, need, you need jobs with a particular machinist skills or welding skills, and some it's mostly healthcare pathways. In fact, for most, it's mostly health, mostly healthcare pathways at this point. The strategy is really overwhelmingly successful, uh, but it is realist, unrealistic for some program budgets. Programs trying to borrow from this model have instead implemented paired teaching or matching teachers to work together to design complementary syllabus, but maintaining their separate classes. So a regional example, uh, I'm going to do a little bit of a spotlight on a regional example to get a better sense of what a local program or regional program looks like. And I know this is hard to see, but I'll describe it. So this is a career pathways map from uh, based in Chicago. It's a partnership between Daly College and a community-based organization, Central State SARE. They've developed a program that's designed to help low-income workers access training and credentials to get them on a path to self-sufficiency. 
So the first, the, um, the horizontal bars, there's about three of them in this graph, show the entrance for people at different skill levels. So the bottom one is for those uh, who have uh, lower skills, and those are just a healthcare career prep program. That's an initial pre-bridge, and those are offered for students with below a ninth grade skills. And they contextualize their basic skills with just general workforce readiness, a, re a career awareness about the healthcare field, and over time, they help students transition into one of three different pathways, which are the top three columns that you'll see there. So after a student gets a good sense of the career awareness and what the options are for them in that particular field, they can choose to go into a, a specific occupational pathway. And this one, this particular program, offers a CNA pathway, a billing, medical billing pathway, and a medical coding pathway. The community-based organization, in terms of the breakdown of responsibility, the community-based organization recruits students, provides case management, and helps identify funding sources and supportive services for these students. The college offers training, pre- and post-assessment and instruction. To date, 159 students who are enrolled in the pre-bridge, which is that lowest level, there was a 90% retention rate and 47% of students completed their ultimate CNA certificate. 25% of those students went on to register for their LPN or RN prerequisite courses. So the idea here is that students have the tools, that they're gaining the tools they need, not just to receive uh, one credential, but to be on a pathway towards higher level uh, success. According to a profile conducted by the Workforce Strategy Center, the program's defining characteristic is the reinforcement of basic education and continued encouragement of students who repeatedly fail to meet expect expected norms of professional behavior simply because they never learned what those were. Um, and, and if you're more interested in this program in particular, you can go to the Workforce Strategy Center's website to find out more details and, and also download this, the Career Pathway Bridge Map. So moving now to state policy. Uh, states have one of the most important roles to play in terms of uh, this paradigm shift in adult education. Not only does the federal law that governs adult ed devolve a lot of the policy making to states themselves, but states also contribute a sizable proportion of the funding for adult education. And maybe, not it's, maybe it's not what we'd like anymore, but it's certainly a lot more than other systems. So the first, and in some ways the most important action that a state can take would be to explicitly make this a priority, um, make college and career success a top priority for their system. And there are three big ways that states can do this. They can do this through a central st strategic plan or central visioning document that is sort of ideally developed uh, in concert with those other systems involved. Sometimes the state plan for adult ed that's provided to the federal government can serve this purpose, but sometimes it may be outside of that federal context. Some states have found that the state plan actually just has too many requirements and the federal compliance requirements for it to really be a truly visioning document. Ideally, ideally, as I mentioned, this would be created with other systems, but really specifically pushed to get your workforce systems and your community college systems involved. This is part of their mission too and not only if they choose to accept it. They have to student serve the students that, they, that come to their door, and a lot of students, you'll find, have overlapping skill levels. We're not the only system that serves students with low basic skills. Another way that states can uh, explicitly communicate this priority is to ensure that funding policies are supporting pathways approaches and post-secondary transitions. So almost every state that's been successful in doing this, with a couple of uh, exceptions, uh, have redefined their RFP process to actually uh, fund programs through their granting process uh, in a specific way that incentivizes a particular type of instructional model. The second action that states can pursue is to braid funding and develop partnerships with other agencies and, instruct and institutions that serve these overlapping populations. And uh, this could include WIA Title I funds, Perkins Career and Technical Education, SNAP Employment and Training Dollars, uh, TANF and State Customized Training Dollars. And it's not just a money grab. These these organizations also have a stake in these career pathways efforts. And you can figure out what, what can be funded and what each of the strengths of these different systems are. Maybe one, fund, maybe one system can fund supportive services, maybe adult education could provide instruction. And figuring out how you can work together to really braid funding, which is, is critical in an era of scarce resources. 
A third action that um, states could be taking is to really help practitioners implement this new focus on post-secondary pathways and transitions. The most per per perfectly orchestrated state uh, initiative is not going to really still help ensure that teachers are ready and are bought into what you're trying to do. Teachers are really the closest to the adult education students and know what works for them day in and day out. They have the best sense of what these are students are facing and the, the, the solutions that could help them with their barriers. Teachers should be engaged very early in the process and over time they should be provided with ongoing and substantial professional development opportunities to really help them adopt these new instructional models. For example, uh, a core component of Career Pathways includes team teaching with CTE faculty, so you're learning occupational skills and basic skills instructor, instruction. So these professional development opportunities might be an excellent opportunity to get CTE instructors and basic skills instructors in a professional de development setting together so they're not just sort of being told how to team teach, but they're actually practicing it from the, from the very beginning. A fourth action would be to set ambitious goals for performance at the state level that are beyond those that are set by the uh, federal government. And this means that you're not really risking any compliance issues with, the, with federal requirements and with OVE, but you're setting higher expectations for local programs and what they should be achieving. A fifth action would be to seed innovation through federal discretionary monies or state funding to really test out some new instructional models. The results from these pilots can then be used to be evaluated in, as, as to what works in your state and then use that criteria and develop criteria to build out, um, to build out a new state RFP or incentivize a, a scaling project within your state. So two state models have really pushed the boundaries in state adult education policy and I'm going to try to go over them really briefly. Minnesota's fast track model, which I'm sure a number of you heard, uh, heard uh, our Minnesota representative talk about in yesterday's transitions panel, was developed during the state's participation in the Joyce, Joyce Foundation's Shifting Gears initiative. This initiative helps educationally underprepared students achieve success in high demand careers that pay family sustaining wages by integrating basic skills and career technical education uh, along a pathway from pre-literacy to post-secondary credentials. Minnesota has developed Fast Track through partnerships between government, uh, nonprofits, local philanthropy, and employers. They offer programming for students at all levels, which is an answer to some of the criticisms that these bridge programs only work for students who are just on the cusp of being nearly college ready. So I know you can't read this, but from, the, from your uh, left to your right, the students at the very left are just pre-literacy students and in bridge preparation, pre-bridge courses. And at the very right is students who are ending up in post-secondary credential programs. There's a program type for every level of instruction. And there's a greater degree of contextualization as you move farther to the right. A former student of an early fast track bridge program said, I felt like it was designed for me. I had a cry for help and I didn't know what to expect. Even with a learning disability, there's nothing you can't accomplish if you're determined to make the change in your life. Now we hear these all the time from students in any adult education program. But the overwhelming satisfaction that students have with these programs is pretty remarkable. Indiana is also thinking really creatively about uh, state adult education policy reform and completely revamping the delivery of adult ed in the state in an effort to drive student outcomes toward the receipt of industry recognized credentials. And these aren't post-secondary credit credentials, but they're industry recognized certifications that have value in Indiana's local labor market. Uh, they're trying to push student outcomes towards these instead of just the GED or a high school equivalency. The state overhauled the adult ed RFP and shifted the administrative hub from adult ed, from education to workforce development. And starting in 2011, state and federal funds are going to be, are, are being distributed to regional partnerships among workforce development, adult education providers, community colleges and current tech centers, and community-based partners. And they each have a specific role to play in these regional partnerships. The amount of funding that's going to each regional partnership, regional consortia, is determined by the region's unemployment rate, previous enrollments, and their performance on student outcomes towards these industry cer certifications. 
Although state policy sets the stage and the parameters for large-scale change, a lot of local programs and regions that are really not necessarily in career pathway states can pursue a set of local and programmatic reforms. In fact, uh, for those of you who aren't in states that are moving towards this vision at the state level, implementing these reforms on your own, tracking your progress, and bringing this model to your state agency can be one of the strongest messages that you can send that these programs should be adopted statewide. So I've saved the most controversial, controversial for last. Uh, the federal policy plays a, an important policy-making role, uh, but more importantly, it really should be creating an environment under which we can all be working better together. So the administration has um, the Department of Education, Labor, and HHS is really in our career pathways corner. Each of these agencies is re, uh, reinforcing an emphasis on cross-system partnerships and building career pathways. Guidance from each of these agencies, official guidance, clarifies rules and regulations about the use of federal funds, that includes Title I funds, Title I youth funds, and Title II funds, to support these system-wide changes and better connect learners with the post-secondary credentials that they're going to need to compete in tomorrow's economy. In addition, importantly, a new joint letter of commitment for career pathways was recently signed in April by uh, undersecretaries of, uh, by the Secretary of for OVE, um, HHS, and uh, the Department of Labor, Education and, um, and Training, to reaffirm their commitment to these approaches. And that letter, I think, is available on, on all of their different websites and is something that you can take to your state um, or to, you know, if, if you're a state, to take to, to the higher, the state legislature, to the governor, to make sure that there's support for these types of initiatives and a reason for working together. The administration is really putting their money where their mouth is to the extent that they have any of these funds to distribute. So in fall of, of uh, last year, the Department of Labor announced the first round of grantees to receive awards under the Trade Adjust Adjustment Assistance Community College and Career Training Grant Program, which is sort of a, a once in a career opportunity. It's a $2 billion program over a number of years that they're handing out in four, uh, four installments. So in, last, in the, the last round, 32 grantees from 35 states received grants for totaling about $500 million that will be used to support partnerships between community colleges, workforce agencies, adult education providers, and uh, principally employers that provide these pathways to good jobs for low-skilled adults who are eligible to receive TAA services. But then once the program model is, uh, is in place, those beyond who are just eligible for TAA will be able to, to benefit from them. Another competitive grant was the Workforce Innovation Fund, which will provide state work workforce agencies and local workforce boards, or consortia of those groups, which is where the adult education system comes in. It will provide them a total of about $100 million to invest in service delivery strategies and system reform, state level reform, that improve the employment and educational outcomes for workers and create more efficiencies in the workforce system so that there isn't a lot of this duplication of effort. And uh, what would an adult education conference be if we didn't talk about WIA? So at the, uh, fortunately there's some news to sort of convey, although you know, you can decide whether it's good news or bad news. Uh, the House Education and Workforce Committee uh, just last week came one step closer to passing the Republican proposal for WIA reauthorization. Um, that's just at the committee level. It's, they have not yet taken it to the full House of Representatives. This new bill uh, that the Republicans are putting out is called the Workforce Investment and Improvement Act. Uh, there's also a Democratic reauthorization proposal that was introduced, uh, but to no surprise, they're diametrically opposed uh, to, and, and uh, have not been able to come to an agreement uh, or a negotiated agreement. Each of these two bills, however, and the Senate majority proposal that was introduced um, last year, that was, was drafted last year, reflect a priority of greater alignment and a focus on career pathways among adult education, workforce development, and post-secondary education. Literally explicitly changing the legislation around, the, around adult education to make sure that more programs are doing these types of models. However, the two House proposals, as I mentioned, differ very significantly in terms of execution. And I think it's important to be aware of the types of proposals that are out there. So I'm gonna go through just a couple of the key highlights for each of these. So if you can read this, if you're sort of one of the people in the front row, uh, the, the first column is the categories and the priorities. The second column is the Republican bill, the provisions that are found in the Republican bill. And the last column is the provisions that are found in the minority bill, the Democratic bill. 
So around the idea of alignment with other systems and providing incentives for systems to work together, uh, the Republican bill institutes shared performance measures so that, you, so that the Title II system and that the workforce system would operate under the exact same performance measures. Uh, they also allow and allow states to submit a unified plan that would cost all agencies. It doesn't require it, but allows it. And it also allows for a super waiver, is what we're calling a super waiver. Um, and that would waive all educa adult education program requirements and would allow a state, if they chose to do so, to dissolve all funding for adult education, all federal funding, into a general workforce development slush fund. It's a very value-laden term, I know. That's what I mean. Uh, this, this slush fund would include any, any job, job uh, workforce development opportunities for any, any person who needed them, uh, much like One Stops operate now. So there wouldn't necessarily be a targeted source of funds uh, for adult education for those students with low basic skills. That's an option under the state. So a state could take that option. They could also not take that option, but it would be there. And right now, that would not be allowed. On the other hand, the Democratic proposal uh, has shared performance measures across all systems, and it requires a joint uh, plan, but there is no consolidation. The programs remain, their funding streams remain separate. On the second area of investment in research and best practices and innovation, I can't tell you how frustrating it is and how I'm sure you all are frustrated that there's so little money put into research around helping students uh, not just obtain uh, basic pre-literacy or basic literacy skills and GEDs, but around helping them transition to workforce preparation. All of the research that's done is really around taking what we know from K through 12 and then we're sort of loosely applying it to adult education. Uh, the Republican proposal eliminates the authorization for NIFL, and right now it's really not funded, but it still is on the book, so it could be funded. Uh, the Democratic proposal takes a different approach. It authorizes NIFL, and it has a new $250 million on research and proposing uh, promising practices and technology, so making sure that the adult education system is using technology effectively. It also expands uh, the amount that can be used towards state leadership funding, up to 15%. Uh, so on the third area of recommendations on funding, the Republican pro uh, proposal keeps funding at current levels uh at current levels for next year and also the subsequent five fiscal years. It also eliminates the maintenance of effort requirement, so states would not have to uh, have a particular maintenance of effort requirement. They wouldn't have to provide a certain, uh, they do still have the 25% match, but they wouldn't have to demonstrate maintenance of effort. The Democratic proposal, on the other hand, authorizes $1.1 billion uh, for activities in Title II, and this would be to include also NIFL and the research on technology, but still would, would, would result in a sizable increase for basic grants to states. On the last set of recommendations and general support of integrated education models where you have two teachers in the classroom or paired courses and pathways, uh, both bills have new definitions for pathways and transition models. Uh, the Republican bill allows these activities um, and the, the Democratic bill requires them. So it really requires a new way of doing business. So I've covered a lot of ground and shared some hopefully new ideas and a variety of ways to start thinking about how to transition to these approaches in your state or in your program. But all of these strategies have one really important thing in common. They're, they're all very resource intensive. Um, and I've heard that a number of times you know, yesterday at the transition panel to making sure you know, people are sort of overwhelmed by the resources that this might take to institute this type of change in their program or in their state. Uh, but when the, and when the vast majority of adult education programs are really struggling just to keep the lights on and the doors open, many of these reforms may really seem, seem a long way away. But the need for these models has, has never really been greater either. Um, and each of these examples I've described today, Indiana, Minnesota, Chicago, was built in spite of or in response to the onset of the Great Recession. The outcomes, 40 to 90 percent transition rates, success rates, job placement rates, these were all achieved during a time when unemployment in some states remained in the high double digits. And none of these programs had new federal education dollars, although some had incentive funding. And all of them had to face the same uphill battle that you might have to, uh, to get new money for their students. But another good thing about pathways and transition approaches that, that's really unique to this type of model is that they really require strong partnerships, partnerships that often come with outside resources and outside assistance. So one funding stream that's really unique to career pathways is employers. So employers are typically outside the realm of adult education, except for limited workplace literacy activities. Uh, they now have a lot to gain from these types of models. 
hospitals, manufacturing companies, large construction companies, uh, and others really benefit when the local labor force is trained in the particular and highly technical jobs that they're now offering. And what's more, by offering these students internships and getting in at the ground floor in terms of designing a curriculum and designing the standards, they're essentially getting free or very low cost customized training and a guaranteed workforce that's really ready on day one. And the examples here uh, in, in this box, John Deere is one of them in Clark Construction. Two, both of those companies uh, in the United States have, have worked with a bridge program in their regional area. John Deere in particular has an excellent program where students can get an internship during uh, the day and then take classes at night. And students get paid internships while they're in courses to really mitigate that, the damage that, that's done when students have to quit their job and go back into school. But we don't have to stop with employers. There's other opportunities out there. Um, even though a lot of formula funding is disappearing and being converted to competitive grants, which is the administration's sort of one of their principles, a coordinated cross-system career pathways efforts really position states well to compete for these types of grants. Whether you're in adult education, economic development, workforce development, or community colleges, um, this climate of fiscal constraint should even really be making us think about grant writing differently. So no longer can agencies or programs afford to compete with each other for these scarce resources. You should really be developing consortia and pooling your resources to have a greater likelihood of success and more efficiently use those scarce resources. Um, it's a testament to you that the excitement and pressure to adopt these approaches is largely coming from the adult education system. You are seeking out new information and new ideas, and you are really driving the energy behind ensuring that learners, that your students have more access to these things, these credentials that they're going to need. But you really cannot do this alone. Uh, the number one ingredient in pathways and transition approaches is building fruitful partnerships. Funding for this system is very shockingly and very shamefully low in proportion to the need. But if this country is going to take seriously a shared recovery among all of our workers, and not just those who are most likely to succeed or traditional high school students, it will require sort of a national chorus of all of these systems working together. So using the tools that uh, the Department of Labor, the, Depart the Office of Vocational and Adult Education, and other national organizations like CLASP have, take them to your likely partners, use them. Um, there's self-assessment toolkits that our adult education uh, partners can use to assess their readiness for types of career pathways. There's funding toolkits, CLASP has a funding toolkit that shows how 10 different federal funding streams can be used to support this type of effort. You need to really take these tools to your likely partners and show them that this can be done and that this wave of change is really a new way of doing business. It's here for good. It's not something that you can just sort of ride out. As a nation, we really owe our students and their families a better shot and we can deliver through the introduction of these new types of models. So I'd like to end with an idea from the director of the Academy of Hope, which is a, a Washington DC based adult education program that's really thinking about career pathways differently uh, with or without the support of the district. The executive director of the Academy uh, says, a lot of people view adult basic education programs as second chance programs. But for many people who walk through our doors, this is their first chance for a quality education. And I'd add that not only is it their first opportunity, but it may indeed be one of their last. Adult students have too many responsibilities and outside barriers to be cycling in and out of disconnected and insufficient training programs. And by rethinking the way that we're delivering services more efficiently, more effectively, we're likely to see much better outcomes for students and programs alike. So on that note, um, I'd like to thank you to CASAS for inviting me here today and for all of you for your dedication to adult education students um, and for, for the opportunities that I'm having to learn here uh, during these, these last couple of days from you. So thank you.